130,000 years ago, our species, Homo sapiens, left their African birthplace and traveled north. They found themselves in a changeable world. The seesawing climate of an ice age buffeted and tested this new species. These hunter-gatherers took on the challenge of finding food, keeping themselves warm, and providing for their children. They had to adapt in order to survive. But nothing could prepare them for an astonishing discovery. They thought they were the only people alive on Earth. But as they made their way up into the Middle East and Europe, they found they were not alone. Another people inhabited the rock shelters. They were the Neanderthals, like us, yet hauntingly different. They must have come by a completely separate path to this meeting. How did these mystery people become fellow travelers on our own great journey? It was in the Middle East that Homo sapiens made the first contact with Neanderthals. The first evidence that our ancestors had traveled this way came from an expedition to Palestine in 1932. Dorothy Garrod an English archaeologist, together with an American, Theodore McCown, excavated a number of sites in the limestone outcrops of Mount Carmel. They discovered an ancient cemetery outside a cave known as School. It contained the remains of ten skeletons. As soon as they looked at the stone tools and bones, they knew they were extremely old. The best preserved skull belonged to a 35-year-old man, buried alone. When the dating was concluded, the remains proved to be 100,000 years old. Though primitive in some structures, such as the brow ridges and protruding jaw, overall, the looks of the school people are modern, linking them to us. These are the oldest known remains of Homo sapiens outside Africa. But then something bizarre happened. Just around the corner from school, there is another cave in the limestone cliff named Tabun. The body Dorothy Garrod found in there was very different. The bones of the Tabun woman were dated to the same period as the school man, around 100,000 years ago. And yet her skull revealed features that were much more ancient. If we look at the Tabun woman beside the school man, we can see that her skull has large double arched brow ridges, a face that pushes forward and a flatter skull. Whereas the school man has the features of a modern human, a higher forehead, less protruding face, and a jutting chin. Who were these strangers, and where had they come from? 
Were they distant family? Or were they some entirely different species? Until recently, nobody knew. Then a phenomenal discovery in the Atapuercan hills of northern Spain finally yielded answers to these questions. At a site known as Gran Dolina, archaeologists have unearthed a treasure trove of ancient bones. These 800,000-year-old fossils are unlike anything else found in Europe. But clues to their origins came from their teeth. Their complex root design is seen in only one other species at one other time. Homo ergaster, who lived in Africa a million years earlier. Ergaster, or working man, was a hominid, a member of the great family that includes apes and humans. An innovative tool user and a meat eater, Ergaster was the first species to explore the world. Not long after they appeared, they began the first great migration out of Africa. They populated the old world with their descendants from Southeast Asia to Europe. These Grandolina bones provide strong evidence for their existence here in Spain. Over thousands of years, they must have adapted to the colder climate of Ice Age Europe. While their teeth link them to an African origin, their skull bones look much more modern. What happened to these Grand Delina people? A million years ago, there were no other hominids living in Ice Age Europe. The most likely explanation is that the descendants of Homo ergaster died out after they gave rise to a new species that emerged in Europe called Homo heidelbergensis. These new people can be tracked over the frozen wastes for the next half million years. From 800,000 to 300,000 years ago, we begin to see glimmerings of an organized lifestyle. Across the European plains, roving groups of this new species, Heidelbergensis, used caves and overhangs as temporary camps. Evidence from sites in southern Europe suggests they made shelters using timber frames covered with animal hides. Until recently, our image of these early people has been murky. Whether Heidelbergensis were systematically hunting game from these bases, or more often scavenging off the carcasses left by larger predators, has been unclear. But now a new discovery has illuminated the lives of these people. Juan Luis Asuaga has led the team excavating a site just a few hundred meters from Gran Dolina. They call it Cima de los Huesos, the pit of bones. Each day the archaeologists enter the cave, they follow the path taken by a mysterious people 300,000 years ago. As they excavated, the scientists wondered how all these bones had come to rest in such a small, deeply concealed chamber. What was the secret story behind the gruesome pit of bones?
300,000 years ago, an ancient people flung the corpses of their dead down a deep shaft. At the bottom of the pit, the bodies steadily piled up, preserved in clay. The pit of bones could be the first sign of ritual disposal. The 2,500 bones found here form the largest collection of hominid remains ever discovered. Since they began 20 years ago, the Spanish team have patiently extracted the skeletal remains of 33 men, women and children, getting to know each one intimately. One died of infection, another was deaf, and one suffered a severe blow to the head. The body of evidence being dug up by Aswaga and his team is completely reshaping the image of Heidelbergensis. The heavy brow ridges, jutting face and receding chin make the Heidelbergensis at Sema look very like the people we came in search of. They are, most likely, the direct ancestors of the Neanderthals. That would make sense. We can track the evolutionary journey of Ergasta from Africa to the Grandolina people in Spain. Now the evidence links these people with Heidelbergensis at Sema and on toward the Neanderthals. There are no signs of Neanderthals in Africa or in East Asia. Most of the evidence comes from Europe. In the mid-19th century, in the Neander Valley of northern Germany, known locally as the Neanderthal, limestone miners unearthed a skull. The bones were initially dismissed as the remains of some poor idiot. Others thought the skull represented the missing link between apes and humans. From the very beginning, the Neanderthal bones were a problem. They didn't fit with anyone's idea of our ancestors. In Paris in 1913, the French paleontologist Marcelin Boulle concluded his extensive study of the bones of another Neanderthal from La Chapelle aux Saints. Boulle painted for his colleagues a graphic picture of this ancient man. The Neanderthal was a slouching, bent kneed, bent hipped, semi idiot. But Boulle made a fundamental error. He misinterpreted the evidence. The Neanderthal Bull studied had suffered from severe arthritis, which had buckled him over. Bull concluded that this was his natural posture, thereby creating a caricature of Neanderthals as inferior brutes. Neanderthals were either too primitive or too far removed from Homo sapiens to be considered successful. These were the ideas of the time. They were evolutionary failures without the graces of language or intelligence. But that was far from the truth. Survival in a land gripped by a bleak ice age called for people with unique skills and adaptations, a people born and raised in this icy world. For 150,000 years, as long as our species has been on the Earth, Neanderthal people 
roamed the frozen plains of Europe, from Spain and France in the west to the shores of the Black Sea in the east. Like our own ancestors, Neanderthals made use of sheltering overhangs and caves. They used similar stone tools. They gathered food and used fire as we did at the time. But we'd see one striking difference if we met a Neanderthal the face. They looked dramatically different to us. In the bone structure of this man's face, we see great overarching brow ridges. The proportions of the middle part of the face are massive. If we see his skull placed beside a Homo sapiens, the difference in size and shape becomes clear. The Neanderthal's eye sockets are much higher and there is virtually no forehead. And the lower jaw slopes back, downwards from the teeth. They lack the jutting chin of our own kind. Their powerful jaws probably acted as a vice to hold skins or timber they were working on. There are severe wear marks on their exceptionally large front teeth. Grooves in the enamel contain microscopic traces of animal and vegetable material. A substantial nose covered their large sinus cavities. These were features especially adapted to a cold climate, allowing Neanderthals to warm freezing cold air before inhaling it into their lungs. These were strong people. The thickness of their bones tells us they supported heavy weight muscles and sinews, capable of hefting the largest modern human and tossing them aside like a fallen branch. Despite their strength, though, they were not a tall people. The average height for males was 1.7 meters and 1.6 meters for females. The size and shape of a species' bones tell us more than just how big they are. They also reveal their shape, and we can tell from a people's shape how they're adapted to a particular climate. Tall, thin-boned people, like the African Maasai, have a greater surface area of skin, so they can lower their body temperature through evaporation. Whereas the Eskimo have developed short-boned, stocky builds to reduce evaporation and conserve heat. Adaptation is the key to survival. Neanderthal bones show their bodies were short and stocky. They were perfectly adapted to living in a cold climate. Despite everything we may have been told, these people were not crude cavemen and women. The Neanderthal brain was in fact as big as, and sometimes larger, than that of Homo sapiens. Like us, the Neanderthals successfully adapted to life on Earth. And for a while, we were fellow travelers. As Neanderthals moved south, out of Europe, Homo sapiens left Africa and journeyed north. That brought them into the Middle East, a world the Neanderthals had already made their own. 
From the school and taboon skulls found in Israel, we know that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals both lived in the Middle East around 100,000 years ago. What did we bring to this meeting that marked us out as being different? What distinguishes us from the Neanderthals? Beneath these rocky outcrops on the outskirts of Nazareth in northern Israel lies one of the oldest burial chambers in the world. Inside the cave of Jebel Kafse, archaeologists found a cemetery of early human remains. Here, our human ancestors buried 21 people, including a young woman who lived close to 100,000 years ago. She was lying on her side, her hands over her abdomen and her legs half folded. At her feet, they had buried a child, about six years old. The only double burial of humans known from these ancient times. The skeletons at Kafse have been described as essentially indistinguishable from our own. These were remarkably modern-looking people, with high brain cases, fairly vertical foreheads, and only slight brow ridges. The volume of their skulls indicates a brain size similar to humans today, and they have that highly distinctive feature of modern humans, a pronounced chin. This very well preserved one of the skulls from Kafze Cave, as you can see, looks very much like modern human, and it's dated to about 90 to 100,000 years ago which clearly shows you that anatomically modern humans came out of Africa, as the geneticists say, and that they, they look very much like us. Not exactly, but getting closer. The fact that these people were also burying the dead and making uh, good stone tools, using red ochre for different purposes, collecting marine shells, perhaps for body decorations and so on, clearly indicates that the elements of some modern behavior were already carried by these people. Another burial at Kafse hints at a sense of ritual. In a small act of ceremony, a pair of fallow deer antlers have been placed over the chest of this 13-year-old boy. This is the very first evidence of a burial with gifts. These people were entering a world of abstract thought and symbols, signs of a developing consciousness. These are qualities we've assumed are unique to our species. But Homo sapiens were not the only ones to bury their dead. In 1983, Kebara Cave on the southern slopes of Mount Carmel gave up a treasure it had concealed for 60,000 years. A man, aged between 25 and 35, the most exciting and complete skeleton of a Neanderthal ever found. As his body was unearthed, it became clear that he had been purposely laid in a shallow pit. Here was graphic evidence of a Neanderthal burial. The archaeologist always asks himself or herself when, when they find the burial, first of all, they would like to make sure that the burial was intentional. So although on the cast you cannot see the outline of the grave, it means that they actually excavated a very narrow pit in which the entire skeleton was placed in. And therefore, many of these ribs, which are generally not very well preserved in a normal excavation, are very well preserved in the case of this Kibara burial. The second thing that shows you that this is an intentional burial is the fact that uh, the skull is missing. And the skull is missing not because someone kicked it away, 
but because someone came and picked it up. And when they picked the skull, let me show you that right here, the third upper right molar fell from its socket in the maxilla, from the, from the skull itself. So basically someone came at a, at a point in time later after the, the, the flesh decayed and removed the skull. So uh, when you look at this burial, you come to think about the humans who dug the hole after this young man died, buried the corpse, covered it, and then maybe came back and removed the skull for an unknown purpose. Something that tells you about perhaps or hints to some kind of a religious beliefs that are not easy to decipher from the archaeological remains. Preserved with the Kebara skeleton, is a tiny bone called the hyoid that sits at the base of the tongue. Its primary function is to enable speech. After the dirt was completely removed, we found this hyoid bone, which looks, looked like very much like a modern hyoid bone. This bone indicates that Probably these Neanderthals, 60,000 years ago, were able to speak to each other, communicate with each other. When you get all these pieces of information, all these components, you have to come up with a conclusion and say, yes, these people were communicating with each other. Perhaps they didn't have an elaborate language, the one we have, but no, no doubt that they were communicating with each other and getting things done with some, with some planning ahead. In some respects, then, Neanderthal behavior was very similar to our own. There are even signs that they displayed care and concern for their fellows. This Neanderthal was lucky to be alive. He'd suffered severe trauma to his right arm. Unless someone was there to care for him each day, provide him with food and support, the chances are he wouldn't have survived. As well as having complex emotions, there's evidence Neanderthals also lived in a world of symbols. The imposing pillar of rock in the Wadi Amud, near the Sea of Galilee, points the way to a landmark discovery. It was made by Professor Yol Rack and his team in 1992. Excavations here have unearthed a Neanderthal child with clear signs of a purposeful burial. Her significance lies in what was found buried with her. So this is, uh, this is the way the Amud baby, Amud 7, was found. Uh, it's a Neanderthal baby, just uh, buried intentionally against the wall. The first elements to be exposed are actually these two uh, bones that belong to the cranial vault and we couldn't tell what it is. I, we knew it's a hominid, but what kind of hominid, we didn't know. We have to wait until the mandible is, is exposed and to realize, the, uh, to realize that it has no chin um, to determine that we are talking about Neanderthal. Because at, even at, the, at this young age, Homo sapiens, the contemporary hominid, has already a chin. And there is really no doubt in my mind that some objects like a, a jaw of a reindeer and some uh, bits and pieces of uh, ostrich shell were put as part of an offering or whatever uh, just before the, the grave was closed. The way her bones are laid out, with her arms pressed to her side and the placing of a jawbone over her body, tells us these Neanderthals felt loss and grief a sense of bereavement which they expressed in a symbolic way. This child was not alone. 
14 Neanderthals were buried in this cave. What makes the Neanderthals so interesting is that they were actually living in parallel to our, with our ancestors. That's what made, and, and so close in time to, to present. Here we have evidence that Neanderthals lived in the Middle East for at least 50,000 years, at the same time as Homo sapiens. It's tempting to imagine that we shared more than tools, burial practice and symbolism. Surely, a people who lived such a parallel existence with Homo sapiens and behaved so similarly must have been closely related, one of us. Well, they weren't like us. I mean, they, the magnitude of differences is really immense. And you see it on the skulls, and I, I would say all the more so on the, on the, on the soft tissues. They were different. They, they were quite different from each other. I think they are more interesting than our, re, uh, our uh, direct ancestors. They were so unique and so uh, special and so derived that they are the real interesting creatures, not, not our ancestors. Our ancestors were just very much like us. So uh, if, I, I, if I do have a, an opportunity traveling in time, these are the creatures that I would like to see. Verification of this fundamental difference came from the Neanderthal skeleton found in the Neander Valley in Germany. A minute segment of genetic material has been extracted from these bones, and that has provided us with dramatic news. The message from the ancient genes is that Neanderthals and humans are not closely related. There are far too many genetic variations between these two people four times what you'd expect to see between any two humans. These are two different species. Almost certainly, we shared a common ancestor in Homo ergaster two million years ago. But from that time on, our evolutionary journeys took us a world apart. Neanderthals arose in Europe, through the line of Heidelbergensis, while we evolved in Africa, emerging a mere 130,000 years ago. Some 40,000 years ago, modern humans left the Middle East and moved north into Europe. This was a disaster for the Neanderthals. Within 15,000 years, they were dead and gone. Their species was extinct. Clues to how this happened can be pieced together from occupation sites here in southwestern France. The limestone cliffs and rock overhangs of the Dordogne Valley offered ideal shelter for hunter-gatherers. Both Neanderthals and modern humans made their home here. But there was a major difference in the way they used its natural resources. During the Ice Age, the Dordogne was a migratory pathway for herds of reindeer. And in the early spring of each year, salmon moved up the river to spawn. From their earliest occupation of the valley, modern humans organized their lives around the seasonal movements of the animals and the fish.
These people ranged around their territory, finding temporary shelter wherever they went. In this way, they stayed close to the source of passing food, like the salmon, which could only be caught during the limited period of the spawn. It was a mobile existence without the stability and comfort of a permanent home base. But the benefits were of paramount importance. They maintained a constant food supply for their families, increasing the chances of survival for the young and the old. This was crucial for the survival of the whole group. The elders were the keepers of tribal knowledge, which they passed on to the next generation. Nomadic life expanded their view of the world, and this in turn opened up their minds. They came to know and understand each new landscape, its plant and animal species. They learned to plan ahead and anticipate possibilities as well as problems. Constant change encouraged flexibility and innovation. Evidence for all these adaptations can be seen in their occupation sites like La Madeleine by the Vizier River in the Dordogne. They created entirely new and sophisticated stone tools to catch the salmon and reindeer. These points found here, when first made, were as sharp as modern steel blades. Seeking the best stone, they gathered material from much further afield, even trading with hunters from as far away as 400 kilometers. Their imagination brought forth new ways of doing things. They manufactured their tools with greater finesse and technical mastery of the raw material. The blades and points were made for more specialized applications. Using resin, sinew and fiber, they hafted the new points to wooden spears, adding an efficient new weapon to their hunting arsenal. As they moved around the landscape, they would have encountered other groups, forging new alliances and exchanging ideas. In this way, human society as we know it may have had its beginnings. Most likely it was this strategic lifestyle that gave our ancestors the critical edge. In contrast, the Neanderthals lived an existence driven by routine and predictability. The evidence from their occupation sites, like Le Moustier, shows us they preferred to establish permanent, central campsites. The design of their tools barely changed over 150,000 years. The raw materials were gathered close by, rarely more than 50 kilometers away. Neanderthals radiated out from their home sites foraging for food in small groups, 
never straying far. Their diet was limited to what they found within a short distance. Even then, they don't appear to have caught reindeer or salmon. Animal bones found at their home sites tell us that instead they were hunting one of the mighty beasts of the time, the wild cattle, or aurochs. Not surprisingly, their bones show signs of rugged wear and tear. Three quarters of them have evidence of healed bone fractures, mostly to the upper body. Accidents took their toll. Encrusted in limestone, this Neanderthal fell to his death. This grim, self-sufficient lifestyle isolated them from other Neanderthal groups and families. But there was one group of people they did come into contact with, the roving bands of Homo sapiens. Although we might expect to see evidence of a violent confrontation, the two species appear to have lived side by side quite harmoniously. From these exchanges, Neanderthals learned to modify their tool design. Territorial conflicts were unlikely at this time when so few people shared the landscape. There were probably only 10,000 to 12,000 modern humans and Neanderthals living in Europe, fewer than 500 family groups scattered across the entire continent. The question this contact between the two species poses is whether they interbred. It's hard to imagine them living side by side for thousands of years without having sex. An intriguing burial in Portugal raises the prospects of at least one instance of interbreeding. Stained with red ochre, the body of a four-year-old child shows a mixture of Neanderthal and modern human characteristics. The limb bones are short and thick-set, while the skull fragments are like those of Homo sapiens. But this curious offspring died without descendants. There's no evidence of Neanderthal genes mixed with ours today. Whatever the relations were between these people, in the end, our species displaced the Neanderthals. All Homo sapiens needed was a slightly better adaptation to the European environment. Geneticists have estimated that a mere 2% advantage in survival rates would have allowed them to overtake Neanderthals in just 30 generations, a thousand years. It was here, on the Iberian Peninsula, that the Neanderthals made their last stand. Gradually, they were pushed into occupying these rugged marginal areas in the most westerly parts of Europe. In isolated caves and overhangs, we find their remains. Here and there, they lingered on. This skull from Saint-Césaire in France is dated to 36,000 years ago. And this jawbone from 27,000 years ago, found at Zafarea in Spain, is the last Neanderthal known to us. These late dates bring the lives of the last Neanderthal people hauntingly close to us. 
The Neanderthals were an extraordinary people. Far from being evolutionary failures, they survived for more than 150,000 years through the depths of the Ice Age. For much of that time, they shared the world with us. They may have been a different species, but they were part of the great family of hominids, our family. With their departure, we became the only species of human being left on Earth. And it's that journey we'll pursue in the last of the series next Sunday at 7. Next this evening, there's a premiere showing of Lost Treasures of the Ancient World as we depart for the Holy City of Jerusalem. King Herod may be reviled for his actions, but what of his architecture? There's much to discover next.